And joining us now on the debate in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Patrick McDonald, law student at Dalhousie University. In the nation's capital, Ann Teutsch, chair of the Ottawa Carleton District School Board's Parent Involvement Committee. And with us here in studio, Suzanne Stewart, assistant professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, that's OISE, and Michael Cook, vice president in academic and advancement at George Brown College here in Toronto. Good to have everybody both here around the table and in points beyond. I want to start by just um, introducing the following to help set up our discussion here. This is off a, web a website called Tumblr.com. I hold a BA degree in communication, the writer says. However, I have not found a quote-unquote professional job in the four years since my graduation. I have gone months between part-time employment through temp agencies and jobs beneath my means. I owe at least $20,000 in student loans and have just borrowed again and begun a teacher certification program this fall. I'm hoping to have a career by the start of school 2013. I'm intelligent, have always been a great student, and I feel cheated. Let's get into this. Uh, Michael, young people grew up believing that if they worked hard and they studied something they loved, they would find a career. Do those rules no longer apply? Well, I think that uh, the nature of work has changed dramatically. Um, so, so we've got uh, high mobility in terms of uh, the incoming of new jobs, quick disappearance of jobs. Um, we've got uh, uh, the impact of technology on the, on the, the workplace. So, uh, yeah, I think the, the nature of work has changed dramatically and people's expectations have to adapt to that. Um, having said that, you know, I, I think the, the story that you've told is, a, it's obviously a real experience, a lived experience, but there are tons of students out there who are graduating and who are finding good work. So it's not typical, you don't think? I think it's one story, but I don't think it's the majority of the okay. stories. Suzanne, what do you say? Well, I do um, agree with my colleague here that economic restructuring has had a huge impact on um, the career opportunities and choices, not just for young people, but for all people at all stages of their career life. Um, <clears throat> however, there are other factors that are also at play, and those revolve around um, the identity of the young person who's been to school and who's looking for work. Um, characteristics of their personality and their attitude have a, are a huge factor in terms of whether they're able to find sustainable work, more so in fact than what their education is. So some students today, this guy says he's intelligent, always been a great student, mm -hmm. he may be an anomaly because other students don't have the right attitude, don't have a good person, is that what you're saying? Right, well often, I mean I'm not talking about this student in particular, but in general, um, attitudes around openness and conscientiousness have a high correlation with job success and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, also things like self-esteem, self-efficacy, family supports, um, mentors, models in the community of the student also have a lot to do with job success. Okay, let's do an honest to goodness real life example right here with us on the program today. Patrick, you're an yes. honest to goodness student. You went to university, uh, you graduated, still, yeah. and now you're back again. Tell us a bit about your uh, background. Well, I did an undergraduate degree in history uh, because I was just told to get a degree, doesn't matter what it's in, it'll be worthwhile. Then I did that, didn't find any work, so I ended up doing a college program for a year, a college certificate. Worked for a few years, uh, and then decided to go to law school. So I'm 27, I'm still in school, finishing up. Luckily, I do have employment when I'm coming out, but I don't think it's a quite as anecdotal as uh, the story of the Tumblr gentleman. I don't think it's quite as anecdotal as people think it is. And I know a number of people who have gone back to school for teaching degrees, even in law school, getting masters because, not because they want the higher education, but because they can't find work. It's a fallback now. Getting higher levels of education isn't a means unto itself. It's something you do because you can't find work. Let me go back and to the first thing you said, Patrick, if I can here, which is, I was always told if I went and got a degree, there'd be a good job waiting for me somewhere down the line. Who told you that? Yes. My parents, my school, uh, TV, my guidance counselor, everyone told us that. So everybody gives you, the, everybody at one point, I guess we're going back almost 10 years now, everybody gave you the impression that as long as you hunkered down, did well in school, got a university degree, something would be waiting at the end of the rainbow. Have I got that right? Something. And it, 
at just even an office entry level job is what you always assumed as a fallback. And what did the truth turn out to be? Uh, not true. Um, <laughs> and I don't think uh, there's anything wrong with uh, a changing workplace. <laughs> I think the biggest complaint is the debt levels because I wouldn't mind necessarily doing a lot of part-time temp work, but when you're carrying 20, 30, I have some friends that just from undergrad alone are in over 40 grand of debt. Uh, law school will push over 100, and there's nothing wrong with those low-level jobs and mobility, but there is when you're carrying debt levels that our parents never knew when they were going to university. Do you have any idea what your debt level is going to be like by the time you're finished where you are now? Uh, yes, I'm going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 85 thousand dollars, and that's about owning any property or vehicles, uh, that's just where I'm going to be. And I have a job waiting for me afterwards, luckily, but not everyone is so fortunate. So how confident are you that you'll be able to pay that off? Uh, I'm fairly confident I'll be able to pay it off, but, I mean, the time frame is going to be a while. I'm not going to be uh, owning a house or, um, you know, having kids for a while, I think, because of the cost associated with it. Okay. Let's uh, bring Ann into the conversation here. Ann, you've got three children. Are they all in, uh, well, I should ask you, where, where are they in their educational careers at the moment? <clears throat> I've got uh, yeah three kids, and they're uh, 22, 19, and 17. So my youngest is in uh, just finishing high school, grade 12 this year. I've got one second year university, and one who's just graduated from university. And is the 17-year-old going to go to post-secondary next year? Uh, she she wants to go on to uh, post-secondary, but she wants to take a year off uh, before she does that. She wants to uh, travel, do some work, do some volunteer work. She's not exactly sure what she certainly interested in traveling. Um, possibly one of these volunteer programs that you can do through uh, Canada World Youth or Katimovic, that sort of thing. Okay, so that, that's uh, one of her interests, yeah. That sounds pretty neat. How about the uh, the middle child? Uh, what, uh, he or she? He. And, he. and he so is taking? So the middle child is, he's taking mathematics at uh, Carleton University in Ottawa, and he's in his second year, and um, I mean, that's an interesting one because I've actually had, uh, you know, people and, and even his high school teachers say, well, what's he going to do with a math degree? <laughs> And, that was um, going to be my next question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the answer is I don't know, and he doesn't know. And um, but he's doing the math degree because he is interested in learning. Uh, he loves math. He's got a passion for it, uh, and he wants to keep learning. He's not doing it uh, for the job that's to come from it because. He doesn't know what the job to come from it is, and it might be nothing, and he might go on and do, he is talking about going on and doing a master's or, or even further uh, in the math. Uh, where will it get him? He's not sure. He's thinking about it. He's starting to think about it now, and, uh, you know, he's saying, well, maybe I'll be a teacher. Maybe I'll go be, be a, a prof at a university. Gotcha. How about the 22-year-old? So he's starting to think about those things. How about the 22-year-old? So, 22 so he's just graduated from engineering at Carleton. Um, and uh, he's decided uh, he wants to go on and do more uh, at school, but he's taking a, a year or two off, and uh, he's still living at home, so it's uh, cheap for him, uh, not so for us, but that's, you know, <laughs> I guess that's another story. Uh, so he's, he's living at home still and uh, doing some work, and uh, he's into to some sports, so he's doing some serious training and hoping to make it to the national team in his, in his chosen sport, and that may or may not happen, but... He worked hard through school and wasn't able to do the training he wanted to do, so he decided that he would try and do that now while he's at the right age to be doing it. What's his chosen sport? So, um, uh, or, uh, the sport of orienteering, actually, which is a lot of people don't even know about in North America. It's uh, just to just so that people know what it is. It's um, running through. Uh, you're, it's it's a running race, but you're in the forest and you're not on trails, and you've got a map and a compass with you, and you have to follow a route that's marked on the map and get first, you know, fastest guy from the start to the finish going to all these checkpoints along the way is, uh, is the winner. So this is Fascinating. his big sport that he's gotten interest, interested okay. in. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, we don't know how representative the, the anecdotes we're hearing around this table, literal and metaphorical, mm -hmm. are. But having said that, uh, Suzanne, we have heard two examples, the middle child of Anne's and Patrick, who mm. are in university or who, in Patrick's case, initially went to university without much thought as to what the thing they were studying, would it, you know, what job that would eventually connect them to down the road. Is that typical? Well, <clears throat> it's really hard to say what's typical. Um, what the research I've been doing for the last 11 years has really shown is that uh, employment and career outcomes and successes are really more dependent on um, the, uh, the supports and the barriers that the students have systemically. So in 
society, in community, in their families. So it sounds like these young people um, have a lot of support from the family, um, from the community. Which you got to have. Right. And that, that's, those are things that correlate more with successful employment outcomes than uh, education per se, as well as some of the personal characteristics like high self-esteem, um, cultural identity. It's fascinating um, that somebody who teaches at OISE says that education is less important than all of these other well, things. Well, I'm just too. saying what my research <laughs> shows really huh. that you know, systemic supports and barriers, uh, cultural identity, those sorts of things have more of an impact than education does on the employment outcomes for youth. Now, I wonder if that, yeah. if that study, that, that uh, research that you're doing, is more indicative of the university experience as opposed to Michael Community College, where, you know, you go to community college to study whatever, being a cameraman, you, you, you know, you, right, you so obviously want to be a cameraman. Right, but there, I think there's a couple of issues that are coming up here. So I agree completely with Suzanne that, that there are these determinants. The other one that I'd add in is geography. Um, it depends where you are in the country mm -hmm. or where you are in the economy. Um, so that's, that, th those are big determinants. Um, secondly, I, you know, I love the, uh, the, the story of, the, of your son who's doing the orienteering because in, in a mm -hmm. sense, I think the model that we've been given is no longer applicable. And the, the model <laughs> of orienteering and in fa is in fact a really good model. You're, you're out there in a forest of the economy and it, it's changing rapidly and there isn't a path. Where, whereas we were brought up to think, hey, here's the path, you know, Patrick's story. Go to university, you'll get a job. Mm -hmm. I, I think the orienteering model is a much, much more relevant for today. The um, question is, do we have a set of compasses with us while we're in that forest? Well, right now? okay, so those <laughs> compasses, and, and these are the ones we really emphasize uh, in, in, in uh, college education, the compasses are communication skills, collaboration skills, and customer mm -hmm. service skills. And, and I think people have been come, come to believe or, or they think that if they just have a set of technical skills, Bob's their uncle and they'll mm -hmm. get a job. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true in today's economy. Let me follow up with Patrick on that. You know, every parent, of course, wants their child to do better than they did. You know, if the parent got a BA, they'd love their kid to get a master's. If they got a master's, they'd love their kid to get a PhD. But every parent thinks that because they went through it, and if they did okay, they assume that their kid will do okay as well, if not better. Is that your experience, Patrick? Oh, definitely. And I don't think that's an unfair thing to throw on our parents. They, they only know what their own experience was. At the same time, uh, their parents probably thought it was great that they were getting BAs. And my great-grandparents probably thought that was great their grandparents were finishing grade 12. So, like you said, everyone does want to do it. And it's not fair to say that they're not in tune with the world because they're only reflecting what they've done. Um, a good example from my own family, one of my cousins, uh, for years, he, we were kind of not sure what he was going to do. He never went to university. He worked doing retail for a while. And then he went to school to be a pipe fitter. And his parents were, I think, a little, I don't want to speak for them, uh, assuming they'll see this. Uh, so <laughs> I think they were maybe a little wary of that because they were hoping he'd maybe go to university and do that path. He did the pipe fitting. He is making probably more money now than I am going to see for a decade. He <laughs> works hard. Uh, he's very well trained. Um, but I think it goes back uh, to, again, the whole idea that we think education is paramount above all else, like Suzanne was saying, that we look at it to the detriment of a lot of other things, which is experience, communication, and hard work, which my cousin had, and that's paying off for him. Well, that's interesting. Let me put that to Anne, because my hunch, Anne, is, yeah, you know, a lot of the jobs that we actually need in society are not the jobs that parents in their, you know, in their most fervent dreams for their children want their children to be. So you be honest with us here. Would you prefer that one of your kids turn out to be a lawyer or a doctor as opposed to a pipe fitter? No, no, absolutely not. I, um, I, I, do, I, I firmly believe that I, I want my kids to be happy when they grow up. And money is not the most important thing. And yes, you need money to, to get by. And you need money to pay off your debts for going to school. But it's, in, for, to me, I want my kids to be happy and to have enough money so that they're not suffering financially. But I don't, I want them to be doing what they want to be doing in their life. And I think that's really, really important is we have to, we have to look at our kids and say, who are they? Not who are we and who do we wish we were or could have been or would be if we had done things differently or had life to live over again. But who are our kids and what do we, 
what do they want and how can we help them get where they want to get to? I, very, I feel very strongly about that. Okay, you're just way too healthy. That's way too healthy an attitude. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'd ahead, really Suzanne. like to, um, to add something to what Anne's saying, and I do understand what Anne's saying, um, but I come from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I'm a First Nations woman, and my children are all status Indians. And uh, I really encourage my children to, um, in fact, I don't encourage it, it's more uh, mandatory. Sort of like they're expected to graduate from high school. They're also expected to attain um, pro professional degrees. Not just post-secondary degrees, but professional degrees. Um, my Wait, say, say it again. Professional you, you, degrees. No, but you expect your four children yes. to all attain a professional degree. That's right. Which means what? Um, Doctor, lawyer, Doctor, accountant. Doctor, lawyer, something. accountant, whatever. Whatever that they want to do is fine. It would be nice mm -hmm. if they all wanted to become doctors mm -hmm. or psychologists. What even, if they want to be pipe fitters? Well, I, I'm not saying that I don't think that there is honor and respect and ability and money-making ability in something like that. But in my position, so I'm coming from a position where I'm talking about cultural identity, um, things like that. In my position, my children, because they come from a, a home where both of their parents are professionals, they are, they are part of an elite population within a marginalized population. Mm -hmm. And I see them as having a responsibility to the community to um, be models to other young people who may not have the opportunities and the social supports to attain post-secondary education. But they do not live on a reserve, I presume. Well, no, we don't live on the reserve. We live in the city. And living on the reserve doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the opportunity to go to school. Well, what, what it means is access. Yeah. Uh, geography plays a role. Right. Um, there are many other factors, cultural factors, that inhibit Aboriginal young people from attaining post-secondary sure. and secondary education. But when I'm talking about my children, I teach my children that they have a responsibility uh, to attain post-secondary education because they come from a home where they have certain privileges. I get that, that, that they don't that other children don't necessarily get whether they're Aboriginal or not. They have other privileges and supports that are going to allow them to take advantage of those opportunities. Oh, I get that. What happens if one of your kids comes Could, to you and says, "Mom, I don't want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an yeah. accountant, or something like that. I actually want to go work on an oil rig off the coast of Newfoundland, and make 150,000 bucks a year doing that." Well, if if they truly want to do that, and that's what's passionate for them. But what I'm, well, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that education is something that is a privilege uh, in our society. It's put out as if it's a privilege, um, but in fact, education is actually a right. Hmm. And the difference between the attitude that children have and young people have around education as being a privilege or a right or something that they're entitled to changes how they perform in those environments. Okay, fair enough. Michael Cook, you, you win the contest, first of all, today. You have five kids, so right. you have more than anybody else right. around this table. Uh, what are they all doing? Uh, two engineers, uh, both working as management consultants, uh, an IT uh, technologist, uh, college trained, actually three out of the five uh, spent time in college, a yoga teacher, um, and a midwife. Did they all go to post-secondary? All went to post-secondary, but a real mix of college and university. College and university. Are they all doing essentially what they wanted to be doing? They're all doing what they want to do. Boy, that you, you, you batted five for five. Well, That's pretty good. They did. They batted five for five. But I think it goes back again to they followed uh, a very uh, wide path. I mean, it was not a straight path for any of them. But this They've is, all li traveled extensively. But this is contrary, Michael, to what everything you know, we're hearing elsewhere these days, which is if you get the education in the area that you love, you will get a meaningful job at the end of the day in it. Your kids are five for five in that department, and I don't, I don't hear that very often. Well, but, it, but again, I think it's, it's uh, having a breadth of path. Like I think, uh, in a way, Patrick's example that we're hearing today, um, it, it could be cited as a failure, right? You know, he, he did this, then he did this, and then he did this. In my view, he's, he's right on, a, he, he's on that orienteering path. He's checking out, he's moving over here, he's checking out, and that's what, what the economy demands. The problem that Patrick has raised is the, the, the debt, and, mm -hmm. and there I think we've got a real problem. Um, our educational system, by and large, is, is set up for this single path. Mm -hmm. Get a loan, 
Um, you have to be a full-time student. Um, there's penalties if you're part-time or you're working while you're studying or if you're on welfare or something. I mean, there's all these rules. So we need more flexibility we there. We need way more flexibility. So it's not only that the, 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 the parents and the guidance counselors have to change what, what the expectations they set up, but also the, the uh, institutions in society have to change in order to enable a much different way of finding your path. Uh, I'm interested in getting Patrick's view on how you characterized his educational career at the moment. Right. Because, Patrick, Michael suggested that you, know, you might have started a history and then moved to a community college to do something else. Now you're taking a law degree. You were kind of tacking your way through that forest with your compass to find ultimately what you were meant to do. Uh, other people might interpret it as, you know, you, you kind of fumbled and stumbled until you figured it out. How do you view it? Yeah. Uh, a little of column A, a little of column B, I guess. <laughs> um, I, th I think part of the problem for me, and I think for a lot of kids, is we can talk about maybe putting people on the right path and making responsible choices, but most 17-year-olds, most 21-year-olds, have no idea what they want to do with their life. And that's fine, um, but part of going back to what Suzanne said about education being a privilege, the problem is that it's still set up for the privileged. I had the luxury of being able to make mistakes in my education. Um, Michael, I'm not sure if your kids did as well, but certainly in my circumstances, because my dad made enough money, my parents made enough money, I could make mistakes and move around. The problem is not everyone has to do that. And if universities are going to keep growing spots and handing out liberal arts degrees like I got that aren't going to have a lot of functionality in the workplace, You've got to have a certain bit of social responsibility in not putting the middle and lower classes in massive amounts of debt. And that's, I think, part of the problem. And I think 30 years ago, why you never heard of these complaints was because most people that went to university were still privileged. Okay, and but having so said can that... I, can I add something in here? Stand by, Anne, because I want to yeah. do one quick follow-up here. You, yeah. you, you did get that history degree originally, right? Mm -hmm. where yes. Did you, where did you get that degree? At Queen's University. At Queen's. Do you look back now, I guess that was in your late teens, early 20s when you got that degree, do you look back now and say, you know, I didn't become, quote, unquote, an historian for a living, but it did have some value to where I, you know, to, to that path that I ended up on. Do you look at it that way? Definitely, yes. Uh, I think it taught me a lot. of. I grew up a lot of, and learned a lot about myself. But uh, did I need to maybe spend $60,000 to do that when I could have maybe gotten the same experience working? That's, that's, my, that's my question about the whole process is if we're going to say, um, as Suzanne said, that education itself isn't a predictor for lifelong success. It's all these other factors. Why is there still such a focus on dropping a ton of money on a university degree that not everyone can afford? Hmm. Interesting. And you wanted to say? Well, yeah, and actually that, that Patrick's last question there is, is, I guess, where I want, what I wanted to address. And I think, I think it's really important to, to, we need to change, and parents need to change the way they look at post-secondary education. And, and there, in society, there tends to be this, this view that a university education is better than a college diploma, which is better than uh, tra training on the job. Uh, I th we need to change that. We, we need to change that view. A university degree is not the be all and end all. It's where you go if you want to get that sort of education. It shouldn't be where you go because it's going to get you a better job. Because we do know, as Patrick was saying about his cousin, there's lots of other ways to go out and get a good job. Um, and it, it, it can be through college. It can be through um, apprenticeship programs. Okay, but it let me jump be... in and ask you this, Anne. Whatever it was, yeah. 20, 25, 30 years ago when, when you graduated high school, did you go on for post-secondary? Yes, I did. What did you do? I did uh, two university degrees. I did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Where? And then I worked uh, at uh, Carleton University and at Ottawa University. Boy, you guys love Carleton, don't you? <laughs> well, it's You went to Carleton. Two to of home. your kids so far have gone Gee, to Carleton. And my, my bet is that 17-year-old is going to end up in Carleton, too, but that's just a guess. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know where she's going to be. We'll see. I'll fill you in in a couple of years. But did your personal um, experience in post-secondary at those two institutions color the kind of advice that you gave to your three children when it came time to dealing color not only your advice but your expectations of what their educational careers would be like uh... it might have colored it but not the way that that you're implying uh... it it certainly did not color it in in favor of of them going to university no no not at all i think um, uh, i think steve the good news I have is kids who 
Go ahead, finish the thought, <laughs> and then we'll get Michael in. I was say, I think, I, you know, I have kids who are, are academic kids, and they like to learn. They're, you know, one of the, the cliches in the education system these days is talking about lifelong learners. I have kids who love to learn. And uh, they go to university because they want to learn, not because of the job it's going to give them. I don't know what any of them are going to do as a career, and I'm happy that they're happy learning at university. And if they were working, I'd be happy too. Great. Michael, then Suzanne. I, I think the good news is that, the, that there is a real shift. First of all, we're having this conversation today. We wouldn't have had this conversation yes. five or ten years why ago. Not? Um, well, or more why, because people are having the experiences they're having, and that's forcing us to rethink our attitudes. So Suzanne told me before the program, she went to college before she went to university. Patrick's story is a college university story. The story of my kids is a whole mixture of that. And, and I think increasingly, while I, I know that for in, in the last round of applications here in the GTA for post-secondary, 61% of the eligible applicants chose college over university. That's a huge um, shift in, in... Say that again. Of all six, the potential post-secondary students in, in the, the greater Toronto area, 61%... Uh, opted to apply for college and only 39% opted to apply for university. That's mm. a huge shift that we're experiencing. Would have been exactly mm. the opposite 25 years ago. Oh, yeah, easily, huh. easily. And, and today at, at George Brown, for example, 30% of our students have um, some form of university education. So it's no longer either or. It's it. I mean, it's people are weaving things together no, I get over that. a lifelong. I get that, but we're still mm -hmm. dealing with the expectation game here, which is that if even if you do do all of that weaving, which should give you the best of both worlds, right? Should give you the best of the academic and the practical. At the end of the day, is there a job waiting for you in your chosen field in this economy? Uh, well, maybe no, not. No, no. Nine, nine out of ten graduates from George Brown have a job within six months. Have a job yeah. in their chosen field that they love? Yeah, it might not be full time, but they've got a, a, a job in their chosen field, yeah. Because I've heard you guys use that statistic before, but it's not to say that right. they've got a job in their chosen field for which they've been trained that they love. No, I think the issue is around whether it's full time uh, or, or part time, okay. whether it's contractual. Suzanne. So I think there's several different issues that are coming up here in what the other guests have said. And one thing is about the changing context. So I think that's one place that young people are not really being made to be aware enough of the changing context of the job market mm -hmm. and how education fits in with the job market. I just want to make it clear that I wasn't suggesting that education is not a factor in the success of the outcome of employment. Of course education is a factor. There is much research that many statistics that show that people who have higher education, whether it's at the college level or the university level, have better job outcomes than people who have no education. What I'm suggesting is it's not just education itself that contributes. There's other factors For as sure. well. And those other factors are as important or maybe more important than the education itself as a determinant of the outcomes, of the employment and career outcomes. Well, you know what? Can I follow up with Patrick on and that for a second? Because I let me, let me just hold that yeah, thought and I want to go I'd to like Patrick. I'd like to comment on that at some point too. Because Patrick, you of all of the guests on the program today, I, I think have the most recent experiences uh, in many different university or, and or college classrooms. And so I want to get your sense about these other factors that Suzanne just talked about. When you look at your fellow students, be it either in law school now or in university before or in community college before, do they bring to their educational experience the kind of um, passion, interest, desire, uh, seriousness, um, willingness to um, study hard, uh, willingness to, to, to want to uh, you know, suck every drop out of that experience of university or, and or community college that one would hope somebody spending that much time and money you know would bring to the experience not everyone no definitely not um, there's a number of people that do but there's a number of people that go to university just, or even law school I've seen it because yeah, why not this is another I get to delay my adulthood for another few years um, oh. Oh. my parents can afford it if not the government's gonna pay for it and I certainly don't think a lot of people go to it for the joy of learning. Uh, I know I'm in school. I enjoy law school. I love it. But I didn't get it so I could, uh, you know, walk around uh, or orating and telling people what the true nature of the law was. I got it because I wanted to become a lawyer. And I think that's part of the problem is that 
universities, I think, need to realize that whereas they might kind of, and even my law school does this, they might stand by the notion of kind of the Socratic method and the idea that education is a means unto itself. It's got to be a means also unto achieving something in life. Otherwise, it just becomes, it, it runs a risk of becoming what it was 150 years ago, which is a place where rich white men went to kind of hang out for a few years before getting into politics. Okay, I don't want to exaggerate this, so you, you, you tell me That was me an exaggeration, I'm, I apologize. No, not at all, <laughs> but I, I want to make sure that we're leaving the right impression with our viewers today, which is, of the people that you go to law school right now, could you put a percentage on it of those who are there simply to delay their adulthood and they're, they're having a good time in law school because mommy and daddy can afford it? I, I would be remiss if I tried to put a figure on that. It's not one or the other two. There's a balance between it. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe 10%, maybe 20%. But what I, <laughs> sorry, I, I really should have researched that a bit more. But what I'm saying is that from my experience, I don't think uh, higher education, even master's degrees, that actually I would say more so than professional degree like law school. Mm -hmm. I know a number of people who did master's degrees because, not because they were trying to delay adulthood because they were lazy, but it's because they didn't have options. I think that's what it is with law school too is that, it's not because they're lazy and they want to party for a few years. The people that do it do it because they don't have a lot of other options and it delays them having to enter the job force for another few years. And you wanted to say. So maybe I was. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I really like what Suzanne said at the beginning of the conversation about the other factors that are important in getting a job. And I, I think we always need to consider that. I guess one of the questions I would have to Patrick or to anybody else, why, why does one go back to school necessarily because you didn't get a job in one field. What else could you be doing in terms of improving your job prospects? And volunteer work, I think, is, is uh, one that's a, that's a great example. But all of these other things in terms of attitude and, and willingness to work and uh, networking, all of those things are, I think we need to be focusing a little bit more on, on things other than just education when we're talking about employability for people. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Steve, that's an important point. We did this uh, 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 Toronto Next study at George Brown, and, and it showed that there was a significant gap between what employers are looking for and what, uh, what young people think employers are looking for. And, and again, I, I can't uh, underline strongly enough what, uh, what Anne's just said. The, um, uh, the need for uh, uh, communication and collaboration skills, the need for, for uh, customer service. The, 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 your technical skills are just table stakes today uh, and they don't guarantee you anything. So the networking, the volunteer experience, travel, um, all, all of these all things, of that's all part of it. And again, uh, I, I, forgive me for keeping ha uh, harping on it, but I just think this orienteering <laughs> example is really quite wonderful. You started something with that, Anne. Okay, Suzanne, you wanted to say. Yeah, that's good. My <laughs> son's going to be, my son's going to love it. <laughs> so, so some of the, the issues that, have, uh, that we've touched on so far have been around um, being able to adapt to the economic restructuring, uh, looking at how job and educational opportunities are different. And one of the issues that has sort of been touched on and that we've skirted around, but that is really important to talking about career outcomes and educational achievement and how these things intersect, is talking about um, privilege and position in society. Um, our student talked about that. And when, when I think about who is it that is able to attain post-secondary education, who is it that's able to finish high school, who is it that gets the, the best jobs, who do you think those people are in society? What's the answer? Well, you tell me. You're who gets the best jobs? Yeah, who gets, who gets to go to post-secondary education in society in Canada let, today? Let me, let me take a wild stab at it here. Uh, people who live in the right postal code. Yeah, people who come from uh, middle, upper class socioeconomic status, people who come from uh, certain cultural backgrounds where they have uh, economic privilege, social privilege, um, aren't marginalized by the mainstream society of Canada. Those are the people who are able to access post-secondary education. Um, that's part of some of the systemic barriers that exist in terms of career development. Having for said that, more Canada. people are accessing it today than ever. Right. The, the, Fair the, to say? the, the participation rates are much higher, yeah. and and uh, uh, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but the 
stats, I think, would support the position that Suzanne's taking. Having said that, uh, if you walk down the hallways at George Brown College or many of our community colleges mm -hmm. across the country, that's not going to be born out there. So there are institutions and there are places in, 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 uh, in post-secondary education across Canada where the equation is, is shifting okay. again I've radically. Got, forgive me for jumping in here, Michael. We've got a couple of minutes left, and I don't know how many of you remember this piece that uh, Margaret Wente wrote in the Globe and Mail a couple of right. months ago. Since we're doing a little dumping on lazy <laughs> students here today, let's really pile on. I'm going to read this, uh, an excerpt from this column, and then we'll talk about it for a little bit. Laurel O'Gorman is one of the faces of Occupy Toronto. She believes the capitalist system has robbed her of her future. At 28, she's studying for a master's degree in sociology at Laurentian University in Sudbury. She's also the single mother of two children. Quote, I'm here because I don't know what kind of job I could possibly find that would allow me to pay rent, take care of these two children, and pay back 600 bucks each month in loans, she said. Ms. O'Gorman is in a fix, but I can't help wondering whether she, and not the greedy Wall Street bankers, is the author of her own misfortune. Just what kind of jobs did she imagine are on offer for freshly minted sociology graduates did she bother to ask? Uh, okay, Patrick, come on in here and tell us whether or not you think there ought to be some onus on students to have a better understanding that if they want to study sociology or, and, God forbid, mathematics in school, that they have to have <laughs> some sense about what that actually will lead to in terms of a job at the end of the day. Again, I would say that's really generationally rooted. Um, Margaret Wente, I'd be willing to wager, did a journalism degree when she went to school which nowadays people get told don't do a journalism degree how are you gonna get a job in that I think it's really coming from a position of their own experience that colors that uh, and I think it's really a again a position of privilege that it's easy for Margaret to look down and say this person should have known better well how are they supposed to know better I mean if she's a single mother with two children I don't want to rush to assumptions but I'm assuming her parents weren't as wealthy she probably didn't come from as much privilege and part of it is the narrative of uh, upper and middle class upper middle class people telling their kids go to school get an education as Suzanne said because your background colors a lot of that that narrative then got transferred to middle class lower middle class and lower class people who are doing the same thing but they're running into barriers that the upper and middle class never mm -hmm. never had there Michael quick and so I don't think it's fair yeah we, we absolutely need to have everybody uh, participating in post-secondary education. I, I don't think the, the conclusions that Margaret draws uh, uh, take us anywhere as a society. Um, the, it, it, your, she takes us back to Patrick's point around the debt load. What kind of uh, structures do we have in society mm -hmm. to enable participation in, uh, in post-secondary education? That's the real challenge. Lower the barriers. Suzanne started us there. That's where we need to, to end up. Lower the barriers make it more accessible, it is crucial for a good, strong, healthy, vibrant society and economy. And one, one last quick word on this? Yeah, I, I think um, we do need to be, uh, students do need to be aware, I think, of, of where they can go with, with what they're studying, but I think it uh, becomes the, the in, at the secondary level, at the high school level, I think we need to be sure that we're spending time with kids talking to them about what their career opportunities or their post-secondary opportunities are, where they can go, how they can find out about things. I think we need to do a lot of education about education and career. <laughs> Nicely put. Um, can I just add to what Anne said? I think uh, career development with youth and children is a very important part of being able to stop the trajectory of what, what we're talking about with that young woman in Occupy Toronto. There's also a sense of um, the personal characteristics at play there, and that is in terms of responsibility. So each student needs to also take responsibility for what program they're going into, what the possible outcomes, and teaching them to do that as early as possible, even in primary school, is where we as a society need to take responsibility for that happening. And career development is starting in elementary school with children, and it needs to start even earlier than that. Yes. And we'll see whether the announcement from the Government of Ontario today has any impact on any of this. Thank you all for participating in our discussion today. Patrick McDonald, Dalhousie Law student, good luck with finishing your degree and with the job that you've got lined up afterwards. That's good to hear, Patrick. And Toich, uh, in our Ottawa studios today, and thanks so much for being there. Michael Cook from George Brown College, Suzanne Stewart from OISE. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.